the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. You need God, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, again, we haven't come to hear from a man or woman We've come to hear from the teacher of the church who's the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest and Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Assemblies of God, Foursquare, Denomination. We just thank you, God, for all of them that preach the gospel, that are hearing the gospel. We thank you for Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist, Trinity. We thank you, God, for the great churches that are out there, our Adventist brothers and Catholic brothers. No time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers. Workers together in one field building one kingdom that's yours, not a man's. So may all the praise and glory go to you in Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Biblical finances has been our Wednesday night subject because God wants to prosper you. Whether you believe it or not, maybe you've never heard it before, but I want to just review some thinking in your mind's eyes just for a few moments of things that we've already said. A lot of times people go to church and don't have any concept of the idea that God really wants to prosper them. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but if you read and study your Bible that God cares about you tremendously. I was with my grandchildren and I cared about them to make sure they were safe when we went for hikes Wherever we were around water or swimming, they were at one time going into this little lake that had a lot of rocks on it, and I made sure they put their little shoes on as they went in the water because there might be hooks in there. I care about them, and as much as I care about my grandchildren, can you imagine how much more God cares about you? Now, I want to make a statement, and I want you to listen to me. You hang around God... Listen to me. And start to do things God's way instead of your way. Start to desire him more than anything else. And God will prosper you like crazy. The question is never who wants to be prosperous. Because we all do. We all work all the time to better our lives. To have more money. Bigger houses. Greater cars. Nicer clothes. And there's not a doggone thing wrong with that. That's just the way it is. It's not about having nicer things. It's really about having a relationship with the living God in the right manner. The question should never be how many people want to be successful or have a better life. The question really ought to be is whether or not you and I can handle the blessings that God gives us. Because if you can't handle it, you're not going to get it. I don't care how nice or pretty or smart or calm or how you get along in society or social systems, you're not going to get it. If you want your life to prosper, there's only one way, and that's connected with Jesus. And when you find out in the scripture that God really wants to prosper you and you really make a wholehearted commitment to follow him, even though contrary to your own feelings, your own thoughts, your own ideas, you will prosper. No doubt about it. It's not only a promise for me, it's a promise from God who gives a flip what I say. But let's find out that the promise is from God. God backs his word. And if you'll do your part, I promise you, he will do his part. He even promises it. When we look about biblical finances, God wants to take care of you. And he's not against people who have finances or money by any means. He's against people who have money, go for money, and put God somewhere down the line, second or third or fourth. That's when we find ourselves in a mess. In fact, I want to just pop it up on the overhead. First Timothy, the sixth chapter, 
In fact, let's just take a look at verses 17 and verse number 18. It says, command those. Now, here's Paul writing to Timothy. Now, listen to what the Word of God says. Listen, follow me now. We're talking about your future. We're talking about you really being blessed. We're talking about you really being prosperous. We're talking about you really changing a lifestyle in such a way that instead of you being broke down, busted, and disgusted like you've been in the past, that God starts to open doors and the blessings of God, the things you put your hand to, just start to prosper. And you know darn well you want it. So stop messing around and concentrate with me tonight because I can't do this for you. And you don't get it because you come to the rock. You get it because you understand the principle and you put the principle to work in your life. He says, command those. In other words, he says, give attention to, make sure they're aware of. Don't let them just make a decision for themselves. Make sure that it says in such a stern way that they understand this. Command those. And now he tells them something that are rich in the present age. In other words, people who have money right now, that's, not, that's none of you. <laughs> but it's going to be you. And the present age, not to be haunting, in other words, arrogant or pompous, watch this, nor to trust in uncertain riches. In other words, he's telling you not to put your trust in some stupid thing called money. But in the living God, when you put your trust in something else other than God, you have now screwed up and you're no longer eligible for the blessings that God wants to get to you. He says, but the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, he doesn't have a problem giving you, blessing you. Can you imagine all this time you've been broke down and frustrated about life? You didn't have to be. All you had to do is start learning about what God wants and start operating in the ways that God has for you. God will bless you. And here he makes it very clear how that is. It's not about what you have. It's about the God you own. He, I own him. He's mine. He owns me. We are one together. I put my trust in him and not what I have in my pocket. But verse 18 comes along and he says these words, let them do good that they be rich in good works. He didn't say that you can't. You have to be just broke. He just said, have a heart to do something good with what you have. And then he says, and ready to give. Listen to this, and we're going to start a series on giving probably in the next couple of weeks. Ready to give, willing to share. In other words, I'm not so stingy, it's just about me. Now, if you're going to stay stingy and it's just about you, not willing to share, not willing to give, then guess what? You're going to stay broke and you're going to wonder how some people get rich and some people get blessed. Some people are happy. Some people are fulfilled and other people aren't. And that's where we look at this and we see ourselves oftentimes not realizing something. Now, I have taught the word of God for 40, almost 35, 40 years. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. I have learned something. We teach in a superficial level in our educational systems. What I mean by that is we teach what to learn and we never teach by experience oftentimes. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But let me explain a little bit more. Let me go for you a little more detail. In the Bible, he tells you what to do, tells you how to do it, tells you the pitfalls of not doing it, and then warns you about what life's going to be like if you take a different direction. In other words, training comes oftentimes through warning, not just through education. Listen to me. I'm with my grandchildren. They're starting to run into this little lake up in Silver Lake in the June Lake Loop area, little beach my mom and dad took me to when I was six years old, fish there, hadn't changed much. Took my grandkids, really cool, took my, uh, you know, my children, and they saw the water, it was a hot day, they ran to the water. I was fearful of them stepping on a fishing hook, because that's a fishing beach. So I had to share with them, don't go in that water without some shoes on. You're, this, and, and I had to, with my other grandchildren, I, I, I showed them the, the, the hook, because we were fishing a little further down. And I said, this goes in, it doesn't come out easy. It's got a, it's got a, a, a little hook on the end of it. It's got a little snag on there, it won't come out. It'll pull out part of your muscle when you pull this out. It's made to go in and not made to come out. And by fear of warning, they learned a lesson. Not by just me saying it. Now, we want people to come and just tell us how it is. But sometimes God wants to share with us a warning so we don't ever get to the place where when we start to prosper, we get our eyes off of Jesus. Are you following me? 
So tonight, with that in mind, when we put our trust in money, things happen that are bad in your life. Now, listen to what I'm going to say to you. When we put our trust in money, four things God wants to share with you tonight. Something is going to take place. And the object of this is for you to learn through the warning so that you really pay attention to this. Why? Because of what I said earlier. You're going to prosper. Listen to me. You hang around this place, you're going to prosper. Your homes are going to get better. Your lifestyle's going to get better. Your, I don't care about recession. God's not in recession. I don't care if a Democrat or Republican or a, 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 an Independent or anybody else is in the White House. God's on the throne. Are you following me? And you're going to get blessed. Now, wouldn't it be terrible if you got blessed, didn't understand the principles, didn't take it serious, and started looking at the blessing instead of the one who blessed you? Then you lost everything. And why haven't done my job as a pastor? Is anybody listening? Now, so write these words down. When we put our trust in money, number one. When you put your trust in money instead of in God, you put your desire, your security, your confidence in money instead of God, here's what happens, number one. It brings misery to your life. And a lot of times we don't realize that just give me money, I'll be happy. Just give me money, I'll be satisfied. Just give me something. Let me pay my bills. Let me have that house. Let me have an abundance. Of let me have a better car. Let me have all these things. And let me tell you something. You may have those things and still fail in life and be miserable. You have heard it all of your life about successful people that had everything, that rock star status and economics and went out and killed themselves. You've heard it over and over and over again because you were never made to be anything but someone who trusts God. And when you put your trust in something else, and can I tell you something? It's so sneaky, you don't even know you're doing it. You don't realize it. You may even still be going to church, but your heart is really somewhere else. You may be singing songs to God, but you're really, your mind is somewhere else. Or you used to be fervent for the things of the Lord, but now you've backed off because things are cool and things are going good. And all of a sudden there's a warning. And here's the warning, is that you will be miserable in your life, even though you have the money. Like we've seen so many times in people's lives. The Word of God makes it so very clear. Go with me to James in the fifth chapter. You'll find James right behind the wonderful book of Hebrews, do you know where that's at? We'll be there this weekend. Verse number one says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Here's somebody that's rich. Their miseries have come upon them. Why? Because they didn't put Jesus first and keep him first. Let me tell you something. Let me say it again. you got to put Jesus first and you got to keep him first. And when God starts to bless you, we oftentimes forget about who he is and what he's done for us. We think we've done it. We think we've got it. We don't think we could ever have anything. We've just in the last few years heard of billionaires that have lost all of their billions of dollars and are broke today. They never thought they could, but their trust was in something different than Jesus. And it brings misery to their life. Verse number two comes along and makes this statement. It says, your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eaten. Why? Because God's not in it. And anything that God's not in fades away, rots away, doesn't work. Now, wait a minute. If you're going to get blessed and God's going to put you finances on your life and you're going to prosper in your life, then you have to take this warning that you do not want to be someone who's miserable and you will be miserable without God. Let me tell you something. People win the lottery. You think, oh man, they got it made. Did you know most of them are divorced and their families are astray and drug addicts and have gone down the tubes of life? They had all the money they could possibly want, but they didn't have God. And that was the warning that we had right off the bat. Verse number three comes along and makes this statement. It says, your gold and your silver are corroded and, and, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. 
You have heaped up treasures in your last days. You, what, here's, you know what heaped up treasures in his last days means? Heaped up treasures in his last days means you got it all together, the day's over. You just died. You worked all your life, you got a whole bunch, you got it all together. Hi, hey, bang, dead, didn't take a thing with you. You heaped up treasures in the last days. Nothing can be stupider and more miserable than work all your life and at the end of your life have nothing. But with God, you always have something. He's right there with you. Come on, somebody. We're talking about a wonderful subject is when you put trust first. Why? Because we're learning from the warnings. Is that okay? Because I want you to prosper and I don't want you to prosper for a little while. I want you to continue to prosper. Here's warning number two when you put your trust in money. It'll take you off course. There's a course that God has for you that takes you someplace and does something. And this will take you off course and get you out of directions. When you put your trust in something like money, I'm here to tell you something. It'll get you away from the things that God has for you. and lead you to a place you don't want to be and find yourself back to number one, miserable in your life. The Bible makes it very clear 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, verse number 9. You were there, 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, 17, 18. Now go with me to 9 and 10. Let's just pop it up on the overhead. But those who desire to be rich. See, your desire is not to be rich. Your desire is to have God. If your desire is to be rich, you got it backwards. Your desire has got to be for God, and God will make you rich. If your desire is to be rich then God is in second place and now you're going to live that number one life, a miserable life. But those who desire to be rich will fall into temptations and a snare and unto many foolish and harmful lusts which will, will draw men in destruction and perdition. Verse number 10 comes along and makes this statement. For the love of money is the root of all of you. It didn't say money was. It just says it's the root of evil is loving money before you love God. God's not against prospering his people. God's not against having you abundance. God's not against opening the doors. And by the way, he even makes a promise about opening the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing upon you. Listen to the kind of blessing he pours upon you so much, you can't hold it. How many of you would like to have the blessings so much you can't even hold them? They're too much. You got to give them away. That's God's promise to you. Then he comes along and makes this statement for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. All because they got off and dressed. They strayed away from the thing that God had for them. You can have all the money in the world, stray away from God and be the biggest loser there's ever been. All right, let me say it again. You can have all the money in the world, be the biggest loser because you didn't have God. Stray away from God and be the biggest loser the world's ever known. Have all the money in the world, be the biggest loser the world's ever known because you strayed away from God, got off direction with God. We're talking about the warnings that are in the Bible. Sometimes we just see what God says. We never take the warnings and evaluate them and understand that he's saying them so that you and I don't get caught up in what? Really putting our trust in money instead of putting our trust in God. We're talking about when you put your trust in money, Number one, remember this, brings misery. And number two, it'll get you off course. But number three is kind of fascinating. It'll make a fool out of you. I'm telling you right now, some of the biggest fools I've ever known are people that have a lot of money but don't have a God at all. They think they know everything. They know nothing. The only thing that people are waiting for in their life is for them to die and pass the money along to somebody else. You got to know that's pretty stupid. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a fool. I didn't get saved to be a fool. I got saved to be a child of God. I got saved to be blessed by the Lord. I got saved so that I could be redeemed and free and have a life that God would have for me, which is a whole lot more than I could ever expect for myself. And I don't know why you got saved, but I think we all got saved for the same reason. We flat out finally realized we need God. And it's not just about going to heaven because if it was just about going to heaven, he would have taken it to heaven right after you got saved. It's about living prosperously here on this earth. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it how? More abundantly. 
I haven't come to take from you. I haven't come to be a party pooper. I haven't come to strip you of your joy. I haven't come to rob you from you. I'm not coming to take you and bring you down. I want to lift you up. And that's what God does. He takes his people and he lifts them up. All the people have to do is get into God and God will lift them up. They had a Ferris wheel down in Newport Beach. There was nobody on the Ferris wheel but Pastor Dan and (laughs) two of my grandkids. The guy was running the Ferris wheel, was on the phone, cell phone to his girlfriend. I finally walked up to Jessica and I said to my daughter, I said, how long have they been on that Ferris wheel? She said, Dad, that guy's been on the phone for 15 minutes. Dan's like getting sick up there going around, you know what I mean? And as he's going by, I'm going. (laughs) Point being is simply this, guys. Oftentimes we don't realize that we can be a pretty foolish group of people. Live our lives on a Ferris wheel. Wanting to get off when we don't get off. Wanting to get on when we can't get on. But God wants us on and off, and he wants to bless us in everything that we do. And life is a whole lot more than some foolish thing that we try to make out of. And when you put your trust in something else other than God, you become a fool. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse number 11. It says these words in Jeremiah. You might want to turn there. It's pretty cool words. At first, I didn't quite understand it, but I'll explain it to you. Verse number 11, it says, As the partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches. But not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days And at the end, he will be a, everybody say it. I don't know about you, but I've been a fool. I think probably every one of us in here, if we really admit it at times in our life, we've all been foolish about things. We've made foolish mistakes and done foolish things. But I don't want to do them anymore. I want to learn God's ways and God's will. God's timing. I want to inquire of the Lord and get his direction. I don't want to be a fool any longer. And people who put their trust, so let's examine the verse. As the partridge broods but does not hatch. A partridge is a bird that kind of a type of a strange little bird animal that lays its eggs on the ground where animals, other animals walk by and birds land on it and crash on it. and Oftentimes their eggs get broken and destroyed and the partridge is so stupid it'll go back and sit on the eggs when they're broken and destroyed. Never have them hatch, of course. And sometimes what we do when we're foolish is we don't realize that we're sitting on an egg that'll never hatch And we better get on an egg that starts to hatch, and that's with Jesus and Jesus only, because you've never been able to do it any other way but with Christ. And then he says, and so is is he, just like the partridge is doing some foolish thing, who gets riches, but not by right. See the words not by right? Not by right doesn't mean deceitful. It means not by right. In other words, you didn't get your riches God's way. You didn't get your riches God's way. God's way is he's first. God's way is he's the supplier. God's way, it's his abundance. It's his way. It's his want. It's his desire. And when you get it from some other source other than his way, then you're like the partridge that's sitting on an egg that's never going to hatch. And then what happens is we'll leave in the midst of his days, and at the end, to be considered a fool. Now, here's what the whole thing's all about. You don't have to be a fool, neither do I. All we have to do is make sure that God is first always. 
And everything we've ever got, everything we'll ever be, everything we'll ever do comes because of him. Any intelligence that I may have, any insight that I may be able to accomplish, any physical thing that I may be able to do, any giftings that I may exercise, I want you to know it comes from him. And you've got to have that kind of an attitude that he is your everything. You're all in all. He's your sustainer. He's your support. He is your exceeding great reward. He is your abundant protector. He is your deliverer. He is God Almighty. You'll never be that fool. Last one tonight, we're talking about when we put our trust in God, we're looking at the warnings that are in Scripture. Sometimes we don't ever look at the warnings very much. We look at other things, trying to learn stuff. But here, some of us are walking around a beach with hooks. We need to put our shoes on, and someone's warning us. And his name is God. I like this one. When you put your trust in money, it brings dissatisfaction. It is not designed to bring anything else but that. Dissatisfaction. We think if we just have the money, everything will be cool. Can I tell you something as an old man? Grandpa, your grandpa never taught you anything about God. Let, me, let grandpa teach you something now. When you put your trust in something other than God, that is subject to being removed. But no one's going to ever remove God. And you will always be satisfied if you have the greatest wealth that the world has to offer, who is Jesus Christ himself living in your heart. And without that, my friends, we fail. There's a wonderful text in Ecclesiastes. I love Ecclesiastes. You'll find it right behind Proverbs. Go there with me when you see the big book of Proverbs. Then go right behind to Ecclesiastes in the fifth chapter. In verse number 10, it says, He who loves silver, listen to these words will not be satisfied with silver. I mean, that's a promise from God. Listen to it again. He that loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. Do you remember the time that you got the car? You thought, man, if I could just have that car. Wow, that's the coolest car. And you got the car. Six months later, you weren't even washing the thing. It, it was like a dirt ball parked out in front on the lawn. Why? Because things of this world are never designed to satisfy. You'll always be dissatisfied if you put your heart and life and trust in money. So he who has abundance with increase, nor he who has abundance with increase. In other words, you won't be satisfied even if you have a bunch. And listen to this. Even if it does increase, you won't be satisfied. This also is vanity. So tonight, from the warnings of the word of the Lord, let me sum it all up for you by giving you one last verse in Proverbs, the 15th chapter, verse 27. Write it down. Proverbs, the 15th chapter, verse 27. When you put your trust in money, <clears throat> it brings misery into your life. Number two, we found out that when you put your trust in money, it'll take you off course. When you put your trust in money, it will make a fool out of you. When you put your trust in money, it'll bring you to dissatisfaction. But when you put your trust in money, it'll also ruin your family. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. The most important things in your life. This is what Proverbs, the 15th chapter, Verse 27, he who is greedy for gain troubles his own house. Goes after the stuff instead of the stuff that's really important. Going after the stuff instead of the things of God, you will trouble your house. And how many times have you seen people start to prosper and they end up divorced? How many times have you seen people starting to prosper and they end up failing in their life with their children? end up failing with their finances and things. Why? Because they went after something else other than God. Now, let me tell you something. There's a safeguard here. The safeguard is this, is you never have to be a fool. You never have to be dissatisfied. You never have to live a miserable life. 
You never have to be off course. Well, you can always be on course if you just make the commitment. I'm going for Jesus Christ. He is my first and first, most important. He's what I put my trust, my desire, and my hope in. He is my future. He is my all and all. His name is Jesus. Nobody else, nothing else, just Jesus. Which means that you won't be miserable and you'll be happy. The opposite of being misery is being happy. You won't be off course, but you'll be on course getting the things that are blessed. Online, doing the right things. You won't be a fool, but you'll be considered a wise man and smart. And guess this, you won't be dissatisfied because you'll be fully satisfied. You know, when life is, comes to its end, will you be fulfilled? The only way you're ever going to be fulfilled is in Christ Jesus. If you're married tonight, if you can get both partners, husbands and wives, to go for Jesus all of their heart, you have nothing but success ahead of you. If you're not married and you're single in your own heart, it's a lot easier because it's only you now making the decision. I myself, not myself and them. I myself, by myself, make the commitment. I'm going all out for Jesus Christ. He is my trust, he is my everything. I'm not gonna be miserable. I'm not gonna be off course. I'm not gonna be a fool. I'm not gonna be dissatisfied. I'm going to be the person that God would have me to be. And at the end of my life, I will be, and I promise you this, fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. In a couple of weeks, I'm 66 years old. I love mama more now than I've ever loved her. I had the best time with her I've ever had, just looking at her kissing her. But for some of you, you might think that's some kind of sissy stuff. For some of you might think it's gross. But I want you to know something. Grandpa loves grandma. And the reason for it is because number one in her heart, above me and anything else, is Jesus Christ. Above my children, above my grandchildren, above money, Above anything, in my heart, in her heart, the number one place, and there's only one, his name is Jesus. It's going to take that kind of a commitment for you to prosper. And it's your call. It's your call. You make the choice. I can't make it for you. Sit back, do nothing, wonder why you're an old person that doesn't have anything and nobody likes you and you got all kinds of issues and hang-ups and you're not anything, you're not even close to being cool. <laughs> and that's what you'll end up to be without Jesus Christ. But with Jesus, you live a fulfilled life that's prosperous in every year. It's your call. <laughs> Isn't that good? Come on now. You know it's good. If God spoke to you today, wave your hand. Take the other hand, put it up too, and give him a great big black clap offering. Thank you, Jesus! You're the teacher in the house. Hallelujah! So cool. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Nothing could be worse coming in the house of God, hearing this, wanting to prosper, wanting to live a good life, wanting to live a life that God has for you. They went to cross and died for you for it. Walk out of here, die, and go to hell. Nothing could be worse than that. Let's make sure you're not going to go to hell. Is that okay? There's only one way to get to heaven. You don't work your way into heaven. You're not smart enough to get into heaven. Neither am I. You know, you don't do a bunch of good stuff and get into heaven. You know, you're not one of those people that think you're a positive thinker going to get to heaven. None of that stuff will get you to heaven. You know, a lot of times we think if we just go to church, we get brownie points with God. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that go to church that are going to end up in hell. And they go to church every week. You know why? Because there's only one way to get to heaven. Not your way. Not my way. Not some well-meaning church committee's way. 
but Jesus Christ's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to these words. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way or my way. You've got to get to heaven his way because it says no man goes to the Father. Now, he's either crazy or he's a liar or he's telling the truth. The proof of that is everything that he's ever said has come to pass in Scripture, so he's not a liar. He's not crazy, obviously. He rose from the dead and the tomb is empty. And everything he said has come to pass. And I want you to hear something. He's telling the truth because it all can be backed up with thousands and thousands of years of Scripture that tells us exactly what's going on and how the plan of God came just for you so that you get right with God. Jesus tells us exactly in the Scripture how to get to heaven. He says these words, you must be born again in John 3rd chapter. You must be born again. A lot of times we don't like born again people because Hollywood and movies, books and stories, literature has made born again people look like a bunch of idiot fools. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about being born again and most people that attend American churches sadly to say don't really know what born again means but I'll tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible here's what it means. It means you've given God all your heart. You've given God all your life. Hear me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be and somebody needs to love you enough respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. It's all or nothing. I'll prove it to you, the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. When I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians, that are lukewarm, are not real Christians at all and are going to be vomited from the mouth of Jesus when the time comes. What's lukewarm? Let's identify it. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. You know who God is in your head, but you haven't really got him in your heart. He's just something you celebrate at Christmas and something you understand at Easter but you have him in your head. There's no doubt you know who he is, but that won't get you to heaven. It's about what you've done with your heart. It's not about what you have in your head. And you're going to have to, and I emphasize this word, give God all your heart. Give God all your life. You want to, why I say give? Here's why. Because he's not a thief to rob your heart. It's yours. He's not a thief or a robber or a conniver to talk you out of your life. It's your call. It's your choice. So here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed. We've clapped. You were great listening to the word of God. Don't tell me you didn't get something from God. You heard something from the spirit of the Lord tonight. But don't leave this place the same. Some of you need to get right with God by giving God all your heart and all your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. And I want to give you the opportunity to get right with God. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'll pop my hands together. Bang! You hear that sound? Bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If, I've, if you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, my goodness, come on, make sure today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed. People behind me will see me. The people that I came with will see me. I'll feel funny if I raise my hand. Yep, you might. 
but get over it. It's better to feel funny in a, in a, for a moment in a safe place like church here tonight than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. There's no exits. There's no trying it over again. You're just going to miss everything because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. It's time to stop being foolish and it's time to start being right with God by giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three. Here it is. Get ready to pop your hand up as soon as you hear my hands pop together. Let me see it and put it right back down. It's all you got to do. Are you ready? One. Two. Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Three. Four. Thank you. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? There's five. Thank you. There's six. Thank you. There's seven. Back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. You know you need to get right with God. Tonight is your night. Anybody else? There's seven wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Don't miss this. Come on. I can feel there's another seven of you. Can you imagine that? There's nobody even moving, but I feel there's another seven of you. Where are you? Seven more of you need to get your hand up, and God just told on you. And you know it. There's thank you. There's six of you now that need to get your hand up. Anybody else? There's thank you. There's five of you need to get your hand up now. There's another person right there. Thank you. There's another person right there. God bless you. There's four of you. There's already, see this? There's four more of you that need to get your hand up. You know who you are. You know you're not walking right with God. You know you haven't given God all of your heart. You know you haven't given God all of your life. Come on, there's four more of you. God told on you, you need to get your hand up. You're half in, half out, half up, half down. You know it. And there's four more of you right now. I don't know if you'll respond or not respond. Thank you. There's three more of you now. Thank you. There's two more of you now. God bless you. I know that. See, I could have just stopped at seven. But God spoke to me. There's two more of you that need to get your hand up. Come on, I know you're just all batted out, but I want you to know something. God's got something better for you. Thank you. There's one more of you. Now, where are you? Don't miss this. When you know it was you, anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Boy, you tough. I'm talking tough. When you see the devil face to face, you won't be so tough. You better get your hand up, man. Your, your butt's going to burn in hell for a long time. Today is your day of salvation, and God brought you here for this divine appointment. Mm -hmm. So where are you? There's one more of you. I know there's one more of you. I'm not going to make you do this. That wouldn't be right. Nobody make you. you got to want to do this. you got to say to yourself, I'm going for God. Where are you? Where are you? They're pointing back over here somewhere. Where are you? Thank you. Right here? Is this the, where, oh, there's another one back there. We'll just take the extra ones. <laughs> Anybody else? Real quick, if you, I'm shutting it down. You missed it. You, I'll give you a chance. There's like 14 people right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, I'm real nice tonight because I just got off vacation. <laughs> well, I'm excited about 14 people. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> ah. Could I just, could I just play with you for a minute? Hey, can I? Well, I'm not going to let you go anyway. <laughs> Ushers will just beat you up if you leave too early. So let me talk to you just for a minute. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. While you just clap, God said, don't stop. There's five more. Five more. Wait a minute, I could hardly get the first seven. Where the seven, where the next eight came from, which is 15, I, I don't know where they came from. Now God is telling me there's five more of you in here. He knows your heart. So here's the deal. I'm willing to be a fool a spectacle so that you get right with God. I should just quit after the first seven. Here's what people would have said to me. Pastor Jim, great message. Oh, wonderful man. That was perfect. And seven people got saved. Now, how great. I should have just quit after the other eight. Oh, Pastor Jim, wow, are you spiritual? But I choose to look like a fool and be a fool than to lose you to hell. And I'm fighting for your soul right now. And God said, son, there's five more. Don't stop yet. 
And I don't know who you are. I have no idea who you are. But you know who you are, and you have not given God all of your heart and all of your life. You know him in your head, but you haven't given him all of your heart. Now, I'm only going to give you a few minutes because I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move on. So either you respond because God stopped me publicly, making me look like an idiot just for you, or you don't. But you made the choice tonight. Where are you? Next five. Where are you? I'm out in a limb. Where are you? Don't mind cutting the limb off behind me. I'd much rather try for Jesus than not try at all and be safe. There's five more of you that God spoke. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where's the first one? Thank you. God bless you, my friend. Wait a minute. Don't clap. There's four more of you. Thank you. There's three more of you. Remember, these are all on top of those others. This is the Spirit of God moving. The Bible says no one comes to the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in this house. There's three more of you. I'm just going to close it down. You're going to miss. There's two more of you. You're going to miss out. But God said there's two more, at least two more of you in here. There's another one back here. Thank you, gotcha. There's one more of you. There's another one right over here. God bless you. There's another one right there. That's actually six. There's another one somewhere up in here. Seven, eight. Look at this. This is the Spirit of God just dropping on the house. Sometimes we think we go to church and we say, oh, the guy's a great preacher. Let me tell you something. Forget that great preacher stuff. When the Spirit of God shows up on the house, it's worth something. And God's winning souls right now. Anybody else, real quick. You didn't get your hand up. Thank you. Another one. Another one. Look at this. All over this place, got to be 25 people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come home. Jesus, tell me to tell you, it's time to come home. You've been out there too long by yourself. Come home. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Another one. Another one. God bless you. My goodness, can you believe this? Can you sense just the Spirit of the Lord moving in this place? Anybody else? Anybody else? Wow. Wow, that's worth coming to church for. Give the Lord a great big praise. We do that. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Here's what I want you to do. All of you that raised your hands, and anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff from the family rooms. Get your children. They'll remember this. Bring them. Get out of your seat in a moment. No one leaves the house of God yet. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. Every single one of you that raised your hands, you come right now. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend, but get up here. I want to I see you face to face. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, look at him coming. Come on, come on home. Look at him coming. No matter the road I walk, whatever my wrong, I will be Thank God, thank God. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. I want you to look to your left. His name is Pastor Dave. 
Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. Here are the three things. I want you to know what they are so you don't you know, think anything weird's going on. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Guys, listen to me. you got to invite him to come in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman. Won't come in unless he's invited. He doesn't just bust into your life and make himself known. You've got to welcome him in. He'll pray a prayer that will activate that and bring him into your life. Second thing, he's going to give you some free stuff. Take home, read about now that you're a Christian, and you will be in a moment, what to do next. My goodness, we want you to know what to do next. Free stuff, easy reading. I wrote it myself. I don't even know how to read. So therefore, it's got to be easy reading. Third thing he's going to do is going to invite you to become part of an organization that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. These people behind you are friends. We give away friends. I like what Pastor Dan says. It's just how we what? roll. That's, I mean, you go, that's, that's just how we roll. We give away, we give away, Grandpa, you know, Grandpa. Uh, we give away friends, okay? Call spiritual personal trainers. You meet them before church service. They help you get strong. They pray for you during the week. They go over some scriptures. You know, you need people to pray for you. You need a spiritual friend to help you. Believe me, you have enough rotten friends that'll take you back to the bars and all of the scenes. Now you need some spiritual friends to help you go forward with Christ, okay? So let us help you do that. It's called spiritual personal trainers, okay? It only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Woo!